Good, good. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. Was it, wasn't it nice to be able to have communion with some friends today? So the plan is to do that the first Sunday of every month. And thank you for those of you that um, uh, took part. And if you don't mind, at the end of the meeting, taking your little cup into one of the, the garbage bins and um, just help our, our team. Thanks, Kevin. He's just going to wipe down the microphone. And Maria, could you come on up, please? I have a great story for you this morning, and we're going to be starting a theme this month called Saying Yes to Being an Overcomer. How many would like to overcome something? Yes? So the good, not everyone was uh, thinking about that. Some of you were like, if I'm going to overcome, up here, Maria, yep. If I'm going to overcome, it means there's something I have to overcome. So that's what we're going to talk about today. How do you do that? This is Maria. Come on up, Maria. Kevin's got the microphone for you. Maria is a mom, and I'm gonna play a little video. So tech guys, if you don't mind just uh, showing what I got here. Uh, Maria had a baby born just over a year ago. How big, two years ago, how, how big's your baby when the baby was born? So according to medical records, 390 grams, but doctors say she was born with the weight of 370 grams, because they weighed her with like some equipment on, so they say approximately 370 grams which so, is less than about 13 ounces. 13 ounces, which is just a tiny little baby, not even as big as your hand, about, about the size of your hand. So we're just showing the video. If you want to watch the whole video, if you go on YouTube, it's called Miracle Baby 370 Pounds, or sorry, 370 Ounces, and it's probably about 15, 15 minutes long, the video, just showing. So when, you, when you're having labor, and you're gonna have a baby at 24 weeks, so this is baby's you know, not fully developed. Mm -hmm. What were you feeling? Were you feeling anxious? Were you worried? Were you stressed? I didn't have labor. I was told that I cannot have her. There's no way she's gonna be born. I was told that I have to terminate because she stopped growing inside of me and I had high blood pressure. My placenta stopped functioning. So doctors told me, forget about it. it I'll, I'll kind of cut the story short. So at 23 weeks, they told me, forget about it. We got to make an injection. She's going to die inside of you. And then you're going to have labor. And I said, what if not? Like, what if I say no to that, right? And they said, well, we'll keep you here until it happens naturally because she's not growing. Your placenta is not feeding her. So it's going to happen, you know, give it a couple of weeks. And I said that I'm not going to give up. Um, and I told them, can you please check her weight again? Um, at 23 weeks, she weighed only 330 grams. And they said, there's no point. Like, if we check her weight in a week, it's not going to change. I said, well, please check. So a week later, they check her weight. And the cutoff for doctors to give a chance to the baby is one pound, 450 grams. So a week later, it showed that she weighs 430 grams. So she gained 100 grams. The doctor said, no, that's not possible, but because it's so close to the cutoff weight, we're gonna give her a chance. But you have to understand, one in a million survival rates, and there's zero chance that she's gonna have no disabilities. Um, she's, they said she's not gonna be able to breathe on her own, she's not gonna be able to eat on her own, she's gonna have a lot of developmental issues. And uh, I said, fine, you know, let's, let's go, f you know, let's go for it. So when she was born, it was 370 grams. And technically, they were supposed to not um, hook her up to any oxygen. They were supposed to just put her aside and let it be. But the doctor who hooked her up to, an ox to the oxygen mask, she knew me. I was lucky it was her day. That's called God's favor. Yeah, it was totally God's favor. And she told me like many times after she said, listen, when I hooked her up to oxygen, the whole team was looking at me like, are you crazy? Like, do you understand what you're doing? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to give her a chance. So what were you feeling? You've just given birth and the doctors are saying this baby's going to die. One in a million. For, for two weeks, I was feeling so many things. You know, when you're in the hospital and everyday doctors come to your room and they say, 
you should, you know, change your mind. You should change your mind. You shouldn't do this. And you had just hurt so much from pain, like from crying all day. And I remember just, you know, lying in my bed listening to Laura Woodley Osman and just, uh, just, you know, just, you know, putting the phone to my belly and letting Ivana listen to Laura with the husband. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's just how my whole day was. And then so when they said, you know, today is the day, your placenta basically absolutely stopped functioning. You know, if you want to give it a chance, let's do cesarean section. So we did it. So when it was, I was, um, I was conscious during the cesarean section, right? And she was born crying, like it's in the middle of the surgery and I hear a pretty loud cry. And I'm like, this is it, it's gonna be good. Like this is the sign, like everything's gonna be okay after that. There's no chance that something's gonna go wrong. So you felt God just speaking to your spirit right away to say, she's gonna live. Yeah, a week before she was born, I had a dream. I told it to Priscilla, my, my African aunt. I told her that I had a dream that it's like as though Ivana, you know, when the baby kicks, you, you, you feel like a little kick, right? Or you feel like a little bump. So I, in my dream, it's like the whole baby kind of like stuck out. Like she, she was still covered by my belly, but I could see that she's small, but she's absolutely okay. And I had that dream a week before she was born. I told it to my aunt, my African aunt. She's like, this is it, you know, like she's going to be completely fine. And it was like nearly impossible to have any faith, but I had faith that, you know, God gave me this dream, God gave me this baby, and it's her baby, it, it's God's child, no matter what doctors say, they're wrong. Amazing. So, this little girl, I'm just gonna, um, where's my mouse? How does my mouse disappear? There it is. I'm just gonna bounce you to the end. Near she's the about end. four months here. Now she's two years old. She's running, she's talking, she's talking in two languages at two years old. <laughs> she has zero, zero problems. Like, not a single problem. There she is at home. Loves the dog. Yep. So, Miracle Baby, 370 kilos. Grim. Graham, sorry, not kilos. That would be a big, that was a big, big, big baby kilos. Grams. Thank you, Maria. What she's just talked about is what we're going to do our, our talk this morning on. Um, I just feel we need to have you stand up right now. If there's someone that you know that needs a, like a, a miracle breakthrough, because that's the God that we have, friends. As the doctor said, one in a million. By the way, a million four. 100,000 views of this already. 14 million. 14 million? Yeah, 14 Sorry. million I'm, views. I thought it was 1.4. All right, 14 million views. I stand corrected. That's more than any of my videos. <laughs> <laughs> if you need a miracle, oh God, this is what you love to do, Daddy. It's what you love to do. You love to put a smile on everyone's face and say, only God. And Father, here we have a mom, two-year-old baby at home, only God. Thank you that if you're for us, nobody and nothing can be against us. Amen. And so friends, if you're standing for yourself, just receive that God is able, he's willing, he's kind. As Curtis said, when we have no faith, God's got faith for us. And we bless Maria. Father, we thank you that you gave her a dream. Thank you that you spoke into her spirit. Thank you for Priscilla, who's one of our connect leaders in the church here, who just spoke life and said, believe it. Father, we thank you that you're always with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Maria. I'll take that. God bless you. Perfect. All righty. We just switched to something that I don't want to show. Where is my talk? Give me a second here, friends. Here we go, right here. And right here. All righty. Yes to being an overcomer is our, our uh, theme this month. And friends, what I'd like you to do, if you've got a Bible, is for you to turn to 2 Kings. And we're going to go, sorry, before we do that, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. So these are the foundational 
uh, verses that we're going to look at today. So look what it says here in, this, in the scriptures. Three times it uses the word overcomer. John, who's writing this, is probably in his 80s. He's the disciple that is the youngest of the 12. He's the one that is always the closest to Jesus. John himself said that he was the one that Jesus loved the most of all of the 12. The others didn't write that in their books, but John said that about himself. For everyone born of God, who's that? Go like that, that's me. Everyone born of God, that's me, correct? Me, <coughs> overcomes the world. Everyone born of God has the potential to overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith, that was what Curtis was talking about. Faith is you acting on a revelation. Maria just talked about it. She has a dream. She believes it. We're going to do this. God's going to be with us. That's called faith. When you act on a revelation. When you do what God speaks to you to do. So that's what it's called, faith. And who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And what we're talking about here, friends, is a simple, simple truth that we're going to look at an Old Testament story and a New Testament story. And here's the simplicity of it. The moment that you give your life to Jesus, Jesus comes inside you. Jesus is always talking through your spirit to his spirit. And when God speaks to you, because Jesus is inside you, when you believe what the spirit of God talks to you about, you overcome. When you don't believe what the spirit of God talks to you about, and you listen to all the other voices that you hear, which are generally inspired by the demonic, by Satan, helping, like, so you, you just hear bad news, bad news, bad news. You hear people say, give up, it can't be done, all those kind of things. It's not that they're demons talking through them, but that's what we're talking about, friends, is any time where it's like, give up, give up, give up, give up, that's not God. God's spirit in you gives you a hope, gives you a thought. And if we hold on to that and we act on those things and we live those things, that's called faith, that's called believing, and that's what makes us overcomers. Yep. So two stories real quick. The first one is in 2 Kings chapter 6. Little context. Israel has neighbors. Not all the neighbors like them. And one of the neighboring countries is called Aram. They're Arameans. And the king of Aram is deciding we're going to attack Israel. And they send a raiding party. They send the people overnight. And while they're doing that, the prophet Elisha, the guy after Elijah, Elisha hears from the Lord where they're going to be attacking. He alerts the army. He alerts the king of Israel. They defend themselves. The Arameans go, how did they move all their troops here all of a sudden? And they have to retreat. And it happens time and time again, where the king decides we're going to attack over here. The prophet hears where it's going to be, relays the information to the king of Israel. They defend themselves. The king of Aram is not very upset. That's where this passage, sorry, he is upset. Verse 11, this enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, who is the traitor? Tell me, which of you is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, they said, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words that you speak in your bedroom. <coughs> Did you know that God hears what you talk about in your bedroom? <clears throat> yes, he does. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. And the report came back, Elisha is in Dothan. And then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. The city of Dothan is not the city of Toronto. It's maybe 50 houses. And this little town, this little city, is encompassed by this army, a large force, to find one guy, the prophet, who's hearing from God what our plans are, what's even in the thoughts of the king, the Ar Aramean king, um, and it's being passed on to the king of Israel. Horses, chariots, a strong force. They went by night, surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God, his name is Gehazi, when he got up and he went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. His response, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? Oh my goodness, we're in lockdown. Oh my goodness, there's a pandemic. Oh my goodness, I may lose my job. Oh my goodness, the doctor just said I have cancer. Oh my goodness, my... Spouse just said, I'm filing for a divorce. Oh my goodness. Fill in the blank. Yep. 
What do you do when a big problem happens? And for these guys, it's an army that your boss has been telling your king where these guys are about to attack, and now they pick your town. And we don't have the, the armies of Israel to defend us. There's nobody here. And he wakes up and he just sees everybody around. And his thought is, oh, no, we're in trouble. What are we going to do? He tells Elisha. Elisha says, verse 16, don't be afraid. Can you say that with me? Don't be afraid. Fear, I'm just going to say it simply, friends. Every fear that you have is based on a lie from Satan. Every single fear is based on a lie that you've believed. Every one of them. There's almost, well, there's just over 300 times where the Bible says, fear not, don't be afraid, those kind of things. And the reason why that theme comes up over and over and over and over again is because every single person has a choice when an obstacle comes along, when a difficulty comes along, when a problem comes along. God, I'm going to just say it to you, friends, he almost always is going to, sorry, he is always going to speak to you somehow. Most of the time we miss it because we're, we're too busy, we're in panic mode, and we don't know that he's talking because he talks quietly. He whispers. He speaks to our spirit. And Satan is loud, and he will give you every reason to believe that this is going to be a big problem. It's not going to turn out well. Let's give up right now. Let's cut bait, as we're talking about, if you go fishing. And it's like, just yes, we can't do this. Let's just get out of here as quick as we can. And so the first thing that Elisha says to his own servant is, don't be afraid. You have already believed a bad report. You have already interpreted the circumstances as bad. You haven't even given God a chance. You've gone to enemy around us. We're in trouble. And that's what I do way too often. That's probably what you do way too often. We hear something and it's like we just go to we're in trouble. And Elisha's saying to his own servant, no, no, no. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, Gehazi can't see that. He's looking around and he goes, no, no, it's just the bad guys here. What are you talking about? And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses, horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So he gets up in the morning, he sees the enemy, it's like, oh my goodness, we're in trouble. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Panic mode. Elisha gets up, has his coffee. He's calm, he's cool, reads the newspaper, whatever he does. And he goes, we're okay. There's more of us than there is of them. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think so. Father, would you open his eyes to see what's really going on? And all of a sudden, he sees what God is doing all around. When Maria was talking and says that the doctor just happens to be someone that she has a relationship with. It's like, God put her there. God put that doctor there. She maybe didn't know it when she went into the hospital of who, which nurses are going to be there. But friends, this is what God's like. He puts people right there, and sometimes we don't even see it because we're in panic mode. But God is able to open our eyes to see what he's about to do so that we can begin to have faith and believe and be an overcomer. Yep. So two things in this story, real quick. Number one, who are you listening to? Are you listening to Satan or are you listening to the spirit of God that talks to your spirit? Don't be afraid. Number two is learn to see what God sees. The apostle Paul talked about that the, the things of this world in the natural are less real than the invisible realm. So for Paul's, Paul, when he writes this, it's like crazy talk. He's saying the things that are unseen are more real than the things that are, are real, that we see. So we see trees, we see buildings. And Paul's saying, yep, they're there, but the God stuff is way bigger and more real than that. And in my mind, I'm going, nah, that doesn't make sense. Well, friends, if it made sense, he wouldn't be called God. 
God deals in a whole different realm and he says, trust me in this. Have faith, believe. Yeah? If everything was about our, our mind being able to make sense, then the smartest get to go to heaven and those that aren't as smart don't. But that's not the playing field. The playing field is, are you responding to the spirit of God talking to you? Or are you listening to the spirit of this world talking to you? So don't be afraid. Open his eyes. Next story I want to read is from the book of Acts, chapter 27. And real quick, this story is about Paul, and he has appealed. His, uh, he's in, been in jail for two years. He's, he could have got off. All he had to do was pay a bribe, and he could have got off, the Bible says. But he chooses, because God spoke to him over uh, years, that his final destiny was to preach in Rome. And so you remember that he says in the scriptures in the book of Acts, every town I go to, every place I go, the Spirit of God tells me that trouble's ahead, difficulties are ahead, and you were going to preach in Rome. So he knows that before he gets to Rome, tough times. And we talked about this last week, a couple weeks ago, but he's arrested when he gets to Jerusalem. They think he's someone else. They think he brought in a Gentile into the temple. He's arrested. He almost dies. He, conspiracies try to kill him. Long story short, he appeals to Caesar. They put him on a, on a boat with other prisoners. In the 200 mounted prisoners on this boat, on a merchant ship. So it's sales guys with all their stuff that they're going from port to port selling their stuff. Big boat for the time, that time, a big boat. Paul has a God thought and he goes to the captain and he says, this is the wrong time to travel in the Mediterranean. I've been shipwrecked four times already, wrong time to go. The captain looks at him and he goes, aren't you one of the soldiers? Yes, <laughs> not gonna listen to you. And off they go. A terrible storm happens, a tornado, a typhoon, whatever you're going to call it. And for, I think, two weeks, this ship is going wherever it wants to go. They've lost control. The men on the ship, the sailors, have given up hope. They've cut down all the sails. They've thrown the anchors overboard. They have, they have thrown all of the merchandise from these sails guys is overboard. They're just hanging on for dear life, waiting for one day when it's not going to be black all day long. Terrible storm. Nobody's eating. Yep. And here's Acts chapter 27. On the, on the boat. After they'd gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. I don't know that that's the way we should always start by saying I told you so, but Paul's a, Paul's a little bit more bold than most of us are, but that's how he starts. I told you so. Then we would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Loss referring to all the cargo that's gone. But now, I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong, remember that's what Maria just shared in her story, had a dream, God spoke to her night before the baby is going to be born. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I, I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, what did he say? Do not be afraid. Friends, when I was preparing this talk this week, I had, I just sort of spent time and say, Holy Spirit, what are some stories that are going to uh, share the principle that I want to share on being an overcomer? And I heard the Holy Spirit sort of give me these two stories. I'm reading these stories. I do not know in advance that both of these stories have the same principle and have that little phrase, do not be afraid. I don't know that until I'm reading them and going, oh my goodness. God, you, you can write sermons really well. Here it is. What did the angel say? Don't be afraid, Paul. You must, and then he reminds him of his destiny that he'd spoken to him many times. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Friends, this is how amazing it is that when you're in step with God and believe what God says, even the people around you that are godless and disbelieving and panicking, you bring safety to them. You bring salvation to them. You bring peace to them. Sandra and I live in a cul-de-sac, and there's a total of 10 houses on our cul-de-sac. And we go for a walk most mornings and most evenings. Instead of commuting, because all of our staff are working from home, um, Sandra and I go for a morning walk most days, afternoon walk most days. And as it turns out, we found other followers of Jesus on our cul-de-sac because we're just out walking all the time. And our little cul-de-sac is just full of peace. 
and people are talking about it, about the presence. Now, they don't say the presence of God, but they're just feeling God. Why? Because there's believing neighbors. And the graciousness of God on our life affects other people. And that's what this angel was reminding Paul. Paul, because I'm with you, everybody in this boat's going to live because you have to be alive. No sense killing 278 people, I think it is. is that, I think is the number that they set on the boat. No sense killing everybody when you're there. How about, how about this be a great story for every single person? Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. Courage is another word for believing. Keep up your courage, men. For I have, what's the word? Faith. I am acting on God's revelation. I am believing what that dream said to me, what that angel in the dream said to me. I'm believing that. And it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. And here's two takeaways. Number one, who are you listening to? Same as the first story in the Old Testament. Who are you listening to? Paul could easily look at the circumstances. We're in a typhoon for two weeks. Haven't seen the sun for two weeks. Everyone's given up hope, the Bible says. And the sailors have given up hope. The Roman soldiers are ready to kill all of the soldiers so that nobody escapes. It's just everyone's given up. And the Lord gives a dream, and Paul goes, okay, we're going to live. Not only are we going to live, but he stands up and he gets everyone's attention and says, hey, guys, everyone listen, we're going to live. Let's have a snack. <laughs> That's what he said. Let's eat. Number two, in the first one, it's eyes to see, and in this time, it's ears to hear. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Jesus was asked several times, how are you doing these miracles? And five times, sorry, seven times in the, in, in the book of John, Jesus said this. As a human being, because he's functioning in his humanity, even though he's fully God, as a human being, he says, I can do nothing by myself. And seven times he says that. And seven sort of the number of perfection. It's, I can't do anything. Well, how did the miracle just, how did you just feed 5,000 out of that, that little bit of lunch? How did you just walk on the water? How did you just calm that storm? How did you just command demons to leave someone? How did you do all that? I can't do anything, he says seven times. And then he says this. The end of each one of those sentences, it goes like this. But, you know when you say but, it means all the things that you had at this side really don't count. It's this side, but, and then the truth. And he says this, but. I can only do what I see, I can only do what I hear, and can I only do what my heart tells me. Jesus learned to listen to his Father. He learned to listen to the Spirit of God that was in him, and that's how everything happened. That's how Jesus did miracle after miracle, how Jesus survived, I think it's four times when people tried to kill him, and he just escapes. Every good thing that Jesus did, he said, is not by me as a person doing this. No, it's God whispering, I want you to do it like this. I want you to touch him like this. I want you to speak like this. And he's seeing and he's hearing. And that's how Jesus had faith. Did you know that Jesus lived in faith? To teach us how to do it. He's our example, isn't he? How do we be overcomers? We listen to the spirit of God that's on the inside of us. That's how we do it, friends. I want to do a little advertisement. If this is the topic that you'd like to go a little deeper in, there's an outstanding book that Bill Johnson from Bethel has recommended, and it happens to be written by me. It's called The Faith Zone. All sorts of stories. I went through every story in the book of Matthew, and in the book of Matthew, what are you laughing at, Curtis? Did I not say that well enough? If Bill Johnson read this book, not, not just thought about reading it, read this book, and he said nice things about me. Anyways, I went through every passage, uh, every passage in Matthew's gospel where it says little faith, no faith, great faith, faith like a mustard, all those different things, 
And friends, there's a mathematical formula in the book of Matthew about how faith works. It is very simple. There's a problem. God speaks. There's a reason why that's impossible and a choice to be made. Am I going to listen or am I not? And if you listen, you get a breakthrough. That's the faith zone. Perfect. Yay. It sounds like a good book, doesn't it? It's a very, very good book. All right. If you, friends, clapping means nothing to me. You got to buy it. <laughs> clapping is just like anyone can clap. If you are going through a, ch a challenging time right now, health, finances, relationship, immigration, business, anything, can I get you to stand up? Going through a tough time right now. Thank you for standing. Those of you that are seated, I want you to just turn around, look at people, look them in the eye, just sort of choose one person that you're going to help pray for right now. Just from your seat, you're going to stretch your hands towards these people. Those of you that stood, I want you just to close your eyes. Keep your head up so your friends can see you. And those of you seated, how about you just stretch your hands to someone? And Father, we're asking that their eyes would be open, their ears would be open to what the Spirit of God is saying to them. And friends, we bless you to listen to that little voice. When that dream comes, to value it. When that thought comes from a friend and they just say something and it just sort of shakes your world, it's like, oh my goodness, do they even know what they're talking about? When someone gives you a prophetic word and it's full of hope for your circumstance, friends, we're blessing you to believe it. And when you believe it and begin to live by it, that's called faith. And faith gets miracles. Faith gets breakthroughs. The Bible is full of stories, Old Testament, New Testament, people who heard God, believed God, did what God said, and became overcomers. And we bless you to join all of those people. We bless you to have your stories. We bless you to demonstrate the goodness of God, the power of God in your life. We bless you to have courage. We bless you to not give up. We bless you to hold on and persevere because perseverance is a very good thing. Perseverance gets you to the finish line. So Holy Spirit, bless our friends. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. If they haven't seen, if they haven't heard, Father, may you speak to them. May you give them visions and dreams, prophetic words, that it just makes it easy for them to know, here's what I do. Here's how I do it. Here's when I do it. Holy Spirit, would you do that? Everyone else, do you mind standing up? You can close your eyes as well. Holy Spirit, the rest of us are not in that season right now. We have been and we will be again. And you've, one of Jesus' prophetic words over you and me is this. In this world, you will suffer tribulation. You will have tough times. And Father, I thank you that Psalm 23, even in the valley of the shadow of death, when death seems the only option, it's crowding in on us. The darkness of death is right there. Even at that place, you're with me. Your rod, your staff, it's like the power of God is with me. And in a terrible place, with death all around us, the probability of death on the horizon. Remember, the Lord spoke to David and said, this is a good place for a picnic. And we have a meal together. And the Lord's almost like saying to David, if we're going to pause for a picnic in a valley of, of death, it means it's not a valley of death, it's a, it's a valley of life. And I don't need to fear evil because you're with us. And surely your mercy, your grace, your love follows me, say me, follows me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord 
Father, we just speak that over ourselves, that when a a difficult day comes, you're going to be with us. You're going to be speaking with us. You're not going to be abandoning us. You will be with us. And Father, may our ears hear the right words. May we choose to believe the right voice. May our eyes see what God sees and not just the circumstances that Satan's showing us. May we become overcomers. In Jesus' name, amen.